you remember the first time you stepped into an arena to witness a collision of good versus evil? The excitement in the air. The roar of the crowd. And of course, the blood. It's time to relive those memories big time. A historical wrestling lesson taught by your professors, the legendary Terry Sullivan and Supermouth Dave Drayson. Rocks TV and International Big Time Wrestling present Big Time Memories. Hello everyone, welcome back to another edition of Big Time Memories. I'm Terry Sullivan along with Dave Drayson, Supermouth. Thank you. One time official photographer for Big Time Wrestling whose photos will adorn all of our uh, episodes here. And today, we're taking us back again to the days when Big Time Wrestling ruled the air-conditioned Cobo Arena in Detroit and other cities around the Midwest. And we're going to talk about a guy that you and I could probably go on for hours and hours about. So we're just going to take a couple of minutes. Wait, who did the fans ask for today? The noble United States heavyweight champion, the Sheik. The Sh oh, my lordy <laughs> doors. <laughs> Boy, this will be a good that? one, I hope. Yeah, and you as the official photographer, there probably weren't many better subjects than the Sheik. No, back at that time, I would have to say Kodak, you know, should have given Sheik residuals for all the film that he <laughs> sold to wrestling fans because I, I think he was the most photographed wrestler of all time. Do you ever think that he ever sort of mugged for you? I mean, he might have had an opponent in the corner and saw you out there. To... It was rare, especially when I was a fan sitting in the front row at Kobo Arena taking pictures. He made it a point to look away <laughs> or put his hand up. He just, you know, it's the way he was. But once you got to know him, and even when I was the photographer uh, for him at Kobo Arena, you know, he wasn't, you know... You know, he did his thing. You know, he was in his own trance when right. he got into that ring. He had his routine of what he had to do, you know, walk around the ring, get the fans in, point up to the mysterious, you know, gods that he was, right. you know, possessed yeah. by. You know, he had to take his uh, little ring rug that he had to say his prayers to Allah. You know, he had his thing. And right. once, you know, that bell rang, oh, you know, yeah. all hell all broke business. loose. Yeah. But he also knew you were the official photographer of the Body Press magazine, mm -hmm. and you had photos appearing in all the national magazines. So I imagine every now and then he sort of gave you a little extra eye gouge or something like that. I'd have to look at my pictures and see if I yeah. ever have any direct eye yeah. contact with him. But let's talk about the man himself. Right. Uh, the Sheik, you know, was born June 7th, 1926 in Lansing, Michigan and grew up with a, you know, large family. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, he went into the uh, U.S. Army at a young age. And it wasn't until he returned back to Lansing, you know, that he had aspirations of becoming a mm -hmm. professional wrestler. And I'd like to interject that he did grow up as sort of what you would call a street kid. He was a tough guy, a little hoodlum. Maybe a big, big family, as you said, but they were not well off by any means. Mm -hmm. But he made his debut in the ring in 1949 against the fabulous Lou Klein. Wow. Who was on his shows all the way well into the 1970s. Yeah. yeah. But the one thing I could say, uh, three things I want to make a point of about the Sheik himself. First and foremost, he was a husband and father. Second of all, he was a businessman. Third of all, wrestler. You know, so I think in his lifetime, those in that order, I think, you know, would be, you know, what he was all about. Mm -hmm. You know, he had uh, his wife, Joyce, you know, who was a sweetheart of a woman. Yep. Uh, his sons, Eddie Jr. and Tom Farhat. Uh, you know, and he was just a loving, you know, father to them, you know, gave them, you know, a great life. Oh, he certainly did. Yeah. Second of all, as a businessman, you know, uh, he was great, you know, talent all around the world. He was well known, uh, always main eventing everywhere. And he was making top dollar. Yeah. You know, and when he bought the Detroit promotion from... Uh, 
Jim Barnett and Johnny Doyle back in 1965, you know, he owned the promotion. You know, he was the figurehead, you know, uh, main man, you know, right. had the promotion. But, you know, he couldn't have the chic name as the promoter, which he had his father-in-law, Francis Fleischer, take on that role. What did Who, he pay for Detroit? I think you know, it 10, was 50000 $50, yeah. yeah. And he actually paid for it, which is unusual in wrestling. Sometimes people like Dick the Bruiser and Wilbur Snyder, just as one example that comes to mind, no disrespect, but they wanted the Indianapolis Territory. They took it. Yeah, but how... You know, fifty thousand dollars back in nineteen sixty-five. That's yeah. you know, quite a lot of change. Right. But he had the money. He brought it, uh, and just uh, made big-time wrestling into you know he it, it exploded. You know, complete sellouts for how yeah. many shows every two weeks. Yeah. And then even in the you know we say the wrestling wars when Dick the Bruiser came in and tried to run opposition to him, the Sheik was running you know every week. You know, mm -hmm. in, in Detroit. Yeah. yeah. His whole objective was to run right up head to head against Bruiser, bring in people from throughout the United States. And the Sheik, as a member of the National Wrestling Alliance, had they all had a, a gentleman's agreement that if somebody came in and tried to invade their territory, that the NWA would supply talent. So the Sheik and some of those shows were just loaded oh, with talent my from God. around Can, the world. Do you remember back in 1971 when this all started, some of the stars that would come in, uh, Fred Blassie, John Tolis, Gorilla Monsoon, yeah. Mil well, Moscaris. Right, you Eddie know, Graham. The, Eddie yeah. Graham wrestled Buddy Fuller on the first yeah. big show they had. Yeah, yeah. and on that show, um, I wasn't the photographer then. But I had to photograph that show somehow. So I went to uh, Les Ruffin, who introduced me to Joyce Farhat, and I showed him my Wrestling Review press pass. And from that day on, you know, they let me take photographs up to the ring, and I was the official photographer, you know, for Big Time Wrestling and the Sheik's promotion. And, there you go. You know, but let me ask you something. You were, you know, the ring announcer and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, TV uh, announcer extraordinaire at the time, along with Bob Finnegan and Chuck Allen, you know, to bring back a few names. Uh, and you worked in the uh, office, in which, the office yeah. uh, up in Williamston, Michigan. Mm -hmm. What was it like to work in the office and to be around the Sheik in the office? I told Rudy Hill on Shooting It Straight that every time I was around the Sheik, it was literally, this is not happening to me. I mean, that's the kind of a, an impact the man had on me from the time I was a kid. And working in the office, one of my jobs was to answer the telephone. And you can imagine some of the calls we got, oh. some of the people who'd be calling, and some of the big name promoters and wrestlers. But, and I was the one who was basically the call screener. You know, I, I sort of developed an understanding <clears throat> of who he wanted to talk to and who he didn't mm -hmm. want to talk to. And sometimes he would say, oh, so-and-so is just giving me all sorts of grief. If they call, just tell them I'm not here. And, but yeah, so I, I would answer the phone for him, but it was amazing. And, uh, you know, eating in restaurants with him, <clears throat> going for coffee with him, it was always an experience. Oh, we were living the dream, yeah. both you and I Absolutely. at that time. And you mentioned before that, you know, he was such a giving person. A couple examples that I want to bring up to show you uh, what the Sheik was like. Because you knew uh, if the Sheik liked you, you were gold. You, you know, were he family. would do anything for you. You were but family, if, and family was, like you said, one of his primary focuses. But if he didn't like you, just stay away. You know, just, you know, watch your P's yeah. and Q's and, you know, just don't even go near him. Just right. do your job and, you know, keep your mouth shut. But two examples I want to give of, you know, how giving he was. Back in uh, Indianapolis, when the Sheik would appear there, uh, he would always uh, see Bobby Heenan. And this was before Bobby Heenan was a manager. Bobby Heenan, you know, sold Cokes and programs and popcorn for the Dick the Bruiser promotion. So the Sheik would give uh, Bobby Heenan $5 to look after his car. Because back in those days, fans see your car and you're, you know, a bad guy, a heel, you know, Tires slashed, yeah. windows broken, spray, yeah, 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 everything. So he always, Bobby Heenan always remembered that the Sheik would always give him, you know, five bucks every time he saw him. And another example was uh, Harley Race. 
Harley Race, when he first started uh, wrestling, he would always take his wife with him on the road. And Harley, eh, he was a little speedster, I'll say mm -hmm. that, you know, driving with him. But uh, unfortunately, Harley Race got into an accident which killed his wife. And Harley Race was laid up for months on end. Sheik never met Harley Race, but he always sent him $25 a week to, you know, uh, stipend, you know, his pay yeah. because he wasn't able to make any money because he couldn't wrestle. The Sheik saw something in Harley Race, and Harley Race went on to become, what, yeah, six times same. National Wrestling I Alliance think he World did Heavyweight okay for Champion. Himself. Yeah. yeah, yeah, pretty good. But going back to being a businessman, <laughs> do you remember uh, back in 1972, uh, Sheik, the Sheik was the first one that I can think of who had a mobile TV truck. Right, yeah. Bought the TV truck, and instead of going into a TV studio to film the matches, he would film them live at the arenas across mm -hmm. the territory. Right, yep, absolutely. We had, uh, and, and not only did we do wrestling, but he also rented the uh, the mobile unit out to musical groups. We had uh, a Motown review once that rented it out. We were doing a kids show, a science show, an outdoor show. I ran uh, audio for uh, the truck uh, during a Bachman Turner Overdrive. Oh, the concerts too. Yeah, yeah, he did concerts. Didn't he they did do the basketball? Seeger show? They did the yeah, Seeger show. Yeah, the night, Seeger right? uh, three three sellout dates at Cobo Arena. Yeah. You know, so, you know, he had this mobile TV truck and he was the first to do it. Yeah. And, you know, uh, they're, uh, you know, a mind for business. Yeah, absolutely. He was uh, really an innovator for, by all means. And later on in life, you know, uh, you know, guys get older, they can't do what, uh, you know, well, him especially couldn't create the mayhem that he used to. Uh, worked Japan because he was just a god in Japan. You know, the, as, you know, the chaos that he caused there, but the, the fans in Japan just loved him. Yeah, very uh, traditional. But oriented. being home a little bit you know, more, uh, he took his time and you know, he was a painter. You know, he did paintings. Uh, he also did, uh, uh, had a plot, uh, flower beds and gardening. You know? Yeah, I never and, knew that. Yeah, uh, well, here's one time, uh, we're at the Sheik's house before you know, one of the shows that we were going to, and me and Killer Brooks were there, and the Sheik had two mini bikes, you know, the little scooter kind of mm -hmm. things. So me and Killer Brooks get on these bikes, and we're rolling through the property, and we're chasing each other and stuff, and at one point, zzz, ooh, oh no, we went right through his flower and vegetable garden, <laughs> and it's like, oh boy, we look back, and it's like, oh no, yeah. we're dead, but we never said anything. Got and on I-96 and headed east. <laughs> yeah, we didn't hear anything about yeah. it, and nothing was said. Wow. And, you know, nowadays, you know, the sheik passed away in 2003. Uh, the sad thing about that was I woke up that morning when I heard the news and I was working for AT&T back then and I took the day off and I says, I'm going to go see my friend at his funeral. And it was a cold morning in January. Uh, driving up there, uh, I get a beep. You know, we didn't have you know, the cell phones and stuff like we do today. And I had a beeper and I noticed the phone number. Uh, a 298 number, and be, working for AT&T, I knew that that was what the uh, television and radio stations, you know, were designated, that 298 phone number. Somebody from the media is on the horn. And it was Dick Purton. Oh, yeah. And Dick Purton interviewed me and asked me about, you know, the life of the Sheik and, you know, about his passing, and I, you know, gave a five, ten minute interview, and, mm. you know, I went up to Williamston and attended the Sheik's funeral, and to this day, probably that any time I think of that, it sticks in my craw because I was the only person from the wrestling business who showed up at the Sheik's funeral. You know, uh, heartbreaking because he did so much for so many guys, for so many people, made careers, helped out careers. Um, he was just one hell of a guy. Absolutely. And that all will be told coming up in 2022. A friend of mine, Brian Solomon, has taken upon the project of writing the biography 
of the noble sheik. So he's in the throes of writing it right now. I'm going to supply you know, a lot of the photographs for him. So wrestling fans, keep an eye out. 2022, the autobiography of the sheik is coming to you. And in closing, Terry, I love how you do this at the end of our segments. Can you, one last time, give us an introduction of the late noble the sheik? With pleasure. You throw the fire as I do this, right? Ladies and gentlemen, from Syria, at 242 pounds, the United States heavyweight champion, the sheik. <laughs> proud to say that I'm a part of IBW. I take pride in IBW that we are a family-run company. It's a fight. It's a sport. At IBW, tradition has always mattered. You're going to see world-class professional big-time wrestling at its best. This ain't no sports entertainment. This is professional wrestling. International big-time wrestling's The Fix. Each and every week, your fix of IBW action. You want entertainment? Look no further than Rocks TV. International Big Time Wrestling! Wrestling fans, if you like what you've seen, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and also don't forget to ring that bell.